Welcome back. I hope you got your drink on. We're uh, going to start eTech Ignite now. We've got nine speakers after me, several abbreviated talks, at least one t shirt that's going to be fired from a cannon, and insights, humor, and technology wonders galore. But before that, I'm going to tell you how Ignite got started. It basically comes down to the theory that geeks and beer equals fun and that a great way to get geeks together is to ply them with beer. So you have to make the geek topics really simple, really short, and easy to digest when there's beer around. So Ignite really comes down to a series of talks, each of which are 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide. It makes the speaker keep to the point. And so if you don't really like the talk, just go get another beer and it'll be better. And because it's so simple, because it's so much fun, it spread, and it spread all over the world. Portland, Bangalore, Paris, Sydney, Seattle, where it started, uh, New York City. We now have a show. And if you enjoy tonight, if you enjoy what you see here, I'd like, like to suggest you go start your own Ignite. It's really easy. It'll make you really popular, at least with the geeks in your city. Uh, it's a great way to have people buy you beer. And if you want to learn more about that, go to ignite.oreilly.com. And if you would like to see some sample ch talks, check out the Ignite Show, which you can find on iTunes and YouTube. Uh, next episode will be released tomorrow. And now I'd like to welcome up our first speaker. She's well known in the forecasting and gaming community. She's been an eTech keynoter in the past. And this year, she's going to be running a forecasting game throughout all of eTech to see what bright ideas we come up with. Please welcome on stage Jane McGon. Oh, wait a minute. But first. The first t-shirt of the evening, fire it. Fire. Nice. There will be more of those where that came from. Please welcome Jane. Thank you, Brady. So I'm Jane McGonigal. I am the Director of Game Research and Development at the Institute for the Future, and I'm here at eTech this week with two of my collaborators, Matthias Crawford and Nathan Verrill. We have built a micro forecasting platform that works like a game. We've created a future scenario for you to immerse yourselves in. I'm going to show you a video from the year 2019 to fill you in on the details of the scenario. It's about a very important emerging technology personal satellites, and then I'm going to explain the rules of the forecasting game to you. So here's the video of your future. What if you had a precision lens above the Earth? What if you could broadcast a message anywhere in the universe? What if you were witnessing history before your eyes? What if you never got lost again? What if you could protect the ones you love? What if you could see the stars up close? What if you could run one experiment in space? Join the first public satellite network, ISAT. Your organization needs a space program. You keep hearing that, but what does it mean? What are the benefits, and what will it cost? Prime Orbit specializes in space solutions for global business. From our launch location in Brazil to a geosynchronous orbit of your choosing, we handle all of the technical details. And what do you get? A secure network of orbital units, accessible anytime, 
anywhere. The stability and speed of the interstellar internet. A year of guaranteed functionality. Prime Orbit, you're not just global, you're orbital. So that's the future scenario we're going to be playing in. That video was made by Kiyash Mansa. And now I'm going to very quickly explain to you how to play. I'm going to go super fast. And basically following Tim O'Reilly at eTech is like receiving an Academy Award. So I prepared some notes. So don't be mad. OK. So let's talk about what you just saw. It's not a prediction for the future. Like Tim said, it's a possible future. It's an extreme future. And our mission at eTech this week is to experiment with this future, see if we want free space, and if we want it, how will we make it? Now, why do we think this future is possible? For several reasons. First of all, CubeSats are real. They exist today. You can actually put one up into orbit. They cost $30,000 now, not $100, but the price is coming down because countries like India, Brazil, and China are actually starting their own mini-sat uh, industries. So and NSF is funneling a lot of research money into CubeSats. That guy, his name is Heiner Klingrod. He is researching how to prevent junk in space from piling up so we can put lots more satellites up there. And also there's a project called the Interplanet planetary internet that's actually happening. They think it'll be ready in 10 to 20 years. We've got online communities like Space Hack, which is for people who want to participate directly in space research, and also communities like Spaceworks, which is an entrepreneurial startup community for people who want to make businesses with CubeSats. Now, that slide looks really bad. That's really weird. Um, what I wanted to do was give you some technical specs for CubeSats, and uh, so they are one liter in volume. You can put up to one kilogram of equipment in it, and they orbit the Earth every 90 minutes. Now, what are you going to do with your CubeSat? We have built a game to help you figure that out. The first thing you do is you think about the best thing you might do with a CubeSat, and then you think about the worst thing you might do with a CubeSat. You only have 140 characters to tell us, and then you play that idea. You can play as many ideas as you want. You can be as optimistic or as dark and cynical as you want, and then other people will argue with you. They'll build on your ideas, and they stack up in flows of cards, and you can follow the different ideas as they stack up and go in really weird directions. Now, the game is going to start um, now, and it will run through the end of Thursday. This is really interesting. All my white text is not showing up. This background is supposed to be black. That's totally weird. But thank God you can see the URL, and also you can follow us on Twitter. Now, we have run two of these experiments before. This is the third and final experiment in our Free Space trilogy. We saved eTech for last because we think you're going to kick everybody else's ass. In New Zealand, they came up with 3,500 ideas. In Germany, they only came up with 951. I think eTech should go for five digits, 10,000 ideas or more. Um, it's not just quantity, it's quality. So here are two tips for how to make a super interesting forecast. One, assume all of the super obvious problems like space junk or stalking from space have been solved and tell us how they were solved. And then say the things that only you you could say your job, your industry, your town, what you care about. Tell us what you would do with a CubeSat. Um, you should try and play at least three cards because your first card will be obvious and knee jerk and not that interesting. Your second card will be witty or cute and kind of smart ass, but your third card will be new and thoughtful and probably surprising. Now, you may have noticed the tagline for Scientific Lab is we love outliers. Outliers are possibilities that are really hard to predict and they take us by surprise when they happen because no one saw them coming. We want to see them coming. So, this is a platform design to create outliers. Um, now, here are things that we call outlier fail. These ideas have been played hundreds of times in our first two experiments, and we're really not that interested in hearing more about them. So behold outlier fail. And then we have outlier win. These are the topics we're really interested in. Things like eco-monitoring from space, disaster spotting and response, that's for Jesse. Hacking democracy, news, games, entrepreneurs, social capital, and basically stuff we never thought of. Um, so try really hard to be one of those surprising ideas um, because we have prizes, we have lab coats. This is a scientific lab lab coat with our logo. These are awesome people who wear lab coats, so you want to be like them. And I'm sure Craig Vettner is really happy to be up there with Dexter the Serial Killer and Dr. McNinja. So um, in conclusion, when I say free, you say space. Free. 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 
Awesome. So we have till Thursday to invent the future of free space. It's scientific. Lab.scientific.org. Lab. Lab. It sounds like scientific, but you spell it like what's your sign. And that was my Ignite talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. I look forward to playing all week. Molly Steenson, are you out there? I'm out here. Be up here well? to the right. OK. Uh, you know, now that we're learning more. Health is a theme of e-tech, not on stage. <laughs> Everybody else, think, never mind. Um, <laughs> um, health is a theme at e-tech this year, and here to talk about how your health can be an algorithm is editor of Wired, or deputy editor of Wired, Tom Getz. Please welcome Tom. Hey. So I am uh, writing a book called The Decision Tree, and the uh, subtitle I'm using is uh, right now something like How Predictive Medicine uh, Can Change Your Life and uh, Help You Make Better Decisions. But way, the way I really want to describe it, the way you guys would understand it, is health as an algorithm. So what I want to talk about today is just a little bit of it. I want to talk about behavior change. We are inundated with all these things that we're supposed to do to change our behavior, to live better, have better health. We, we are told these things again and again. It's drilled into us. It's a cophony. It's a beration. It all comes down to two things that we have to do. We should eat less, and we should exercise more. But do we do those things? No. Behavior change is the hardest thing in all of medicine and public health. People just don't do it. We know what we're supposed to do. We fail to do it. In fact, only 3% of Americans follow four simple behaviors. We are supposed to get regular exercise. We're not supposed to smoke. We're supposed to uh, uh, eat our vegetables, and we're supposed to maintain a healthy body weight. Three percent of us do all four of those things. That's it. Now, this disconnect, this is a huge problem, and it's a disconnect between our will and our actions. And it goes back a long time. Aristotle called it acrasia. He was fascinated by it. He made it a whole book of his uh, ethics, and it's still with us. Thomas Schelling, who's the infant, one of the fathers of game theory and one of the fathers of behavioral, behavioral economics, he called it egonomics. It was this internal struggle that we do in, uh, in our heads, this rationalization, constant negotiation that we do with ourselves to try to get out of doing what we should do. Now, here's why it matters. In ancient Greece with Aristotle, the average lifespan was 30. You weren't going to die because you were behaving badly with your health. You were going to die from tuberculosis, from plague, from some infectious disease. But now in the United States, those infectious diseases don't happen. So the way we die is often because of behavior change. Because, I'm sorry, because we're failing to change our behavior. So what's happening is we're spending 20, 30, 40, 50 years in an unhealthy state. Here's what it looks like. We don't know how to change what we know we need to change. It's a big problem. We get the supersize, we get the nachos, and this is what we look like. So. Uh, so we know that, and this is actually, so it gets even a little bit, uh, this is the causal pathway. That's what uh, they call it in public health. You go from one of these, you start with by being overweight, you get to uh, actual obesity, and then you get this chain of diseases, one leading to the next one. 50% of all Americans die from one of those three diseases. And again, so this, this is this problem. We know what we're supposed to do, we don't do it. This is not an information problem. We have access to the information. This is a systems problem. So what I want to do in the last half of my talk is just give you a few examples of how we can take control. Because it's all about control, and it comes down to creating a system where we can use the information that already is out there and to start to put it to work for ourselves. So uh, does anybody recognize this formula? This is the points formula at Weight Watchers. This is how Weight Watchers turns the nutritional information label into a number of points that somebody is allowed to have every day. And this works. This is self-monitoring feedback that actually is a really effective way. Weight Watchers has figured out how to get people to change their behavior. They use the self-monitoring. They give the, you your points, and they use group work. Those two things, self-monitoring and group work, get people to lose 5 10% of their body weight, which is really what you need. Uh, to make uh, impact on your health, and it stays off. Now, self-monitoring group support, we call those data and social networks. They're the same things that work in information technology. So this is this opportunity that we're at, and this is what I'm, I want to get you guys all at about, 
is putting these same strategies together in information technology. This is my iPhone. I loaded it up with apps that are all self-tracking apps. Some of them are good, some of them suck. But this is, this, this is it's starting to happen. People are starting to create ways to let us track our behavior. So I want to leave you with three principles that the, this system should have, this, this new system of information management. The first one is data. We need to be controlling our data, capturing our data, and putting it into this feedback loop that will be helping us change and actually monitor and improve ourselves. The second is we need to be making early decisions. We need to be using that information back when it's for preventive measures, back when we're choosing not to get fat rather than choosing not to get heart disease because we already have diabetes. The hospital, we have to think of the hospital as failure. The third principle is openness. We need to be using our health information and sharing it and building on it. We, I, I really think there's a huge problem in this country where we talk about, where we think of our medical information as something we need to lock down. We need to keep it private. That's exactly the wrong impulse. We need to be, we need to be making it something that we're sharing and exchanging as currency. We need to be building on what I'm learning from my health, building it together with yours and combining our data and making it into a new apparatus for uh, improving all of our health. So that's it. The book is out uh, next year. The blog is at thedecisiontree.com. Thanks. Thank you very much, Thomas. And now I present to you a treatise on Ted Stevens and a series of tubes by Maui Stevenson. Or not. So former Senator Ted Stevens had it right, just he was 100 years off. It really is a series of tubes. Um, or pneumatic tubes, and I'm going to tell you about pneumatic tube systems in Paris, in the United States, and in buildings. So it really is a series of tubes. What you see here is the vaults of the Paris um, sewers from the 1850s. Um, if it weren't for the success of the telegraph, pneumatic tubes wouldn't have existed. Um, this is an engraving showing the telegraph in the central postal office in Paris, but there was network saturation thanks to all the network success of the telegraph. So pneumatic tube messages would be sent. They were called carte telegrams, so they're physical telegrams sent through the late 19th century Parisian tube network, physical analogs, physical messages, digital messages. This is, the, this is a photograph from 1861 of the pneumatic tube, um, of the vaults of the, Paris, um, of the Paris sewers, and the pneumatic tubes that you saw in the first slide lined the tubes of the sewers, made them readily accessible. These two slides are showing you how big the pneumatic tube network got by 1907, so 1888, Couple hundred kilometers, 210 kilometers by 1907. By 1945, 450 kilometers pneumatic tubes sending messages through Paris. In the steam age, they were run by steam engines. This is the steam installation at the Hotel des Postes in Paris in 1880, showing how the compressed and rarefied air would be complete, would be created and stored for pneumatic tube purposes. Here are how big they were. In fact, they were 19 meters long and about as twice as high by half as one of these guys whose job it was to maintain them. They would use suction and they would use pressure in order to get the messages and the tube cylinders to go back and forth. In fact, these are tube cylinders. And what you see on one side is one of the original ones made of iron sheathed in leather and uh, and uh, with uh, natural rubber. What you see on the other side is actual physical packet switching for pneumatic tube receptacles. These are how it worked in the steam age in the late 19th century. You would crank open the thing, you'd put in your tube receptacles, you'd send off the, um, you'd turn the crank and off would go the messages and they'd hurtle through the, the underground at 50 miles an hour. Um, these are, this is how big the installations were at the um, Central Stock Exchange. And here you see six and six. And then you see this guy kind of in the background who looks sort of like Waldo. He was big on surveillance. You also see child laborers. Sometimes they got stuck. In order to figure out where the obstruction was, you would fire a pistol into the tube and measure the sound waves, which is what you see here. And you could figure out where the obstruction was within two meters. This is the late 19th century version of error correction. And the next slide here is this kind of fascinating thing that I really love and can't really explain, but it shows elevation and it shows the curvature of the tubes and it shows Paris and all of the electrical apparatuses that were in place again in 1880s to measure how fast and how much things curved. So this is a, a postal card from the early 20th century showing someone delightfully licking a pneumatic tube missive, the pneumatic tube um, mailbox, and then again the apparatuses for sending and receiving. However, that's just the Parisian model 
model, which sent telegrams. The US model sent first class post, 1893 in Philadelphia, 1897 in New York, and this is what you see are these really big pneumatic tubes that sent mail even over the Brooklyn Bridge until 1953. Um, and you see kind of train cars, and it worked really well. The problem was is that until about 1907, the, the um, devices for sending tubes, remember those steam engines we saw, they were enormous, they weighed 3,000 pounds each. However, with the invention of the GSO pneumatic apparatus, it was possible to put the pneumatic tubes on a desktop. So you have 400 pounds, pneumatic tube interfaces, desktop, and what it made possible is what you probably remember when you were a little kid, for pneumatic tubes to go hurtling through your bank, the grocery store you worked at, the department store. And so therefore we have Lamson pneumatic tubes from about 1920, <clears throat> these next couple of shots. And um, you see light filled office spaces, happy people sitting at their desks working. On top here you see stenographers, they could sign anything at an insurance company. At the bottom, if you had pneumatic tubes, I don't know why you'd crowd in all that much, but at that shoe factory, that's what they did. They'd take orders and they'd ship them off and it was all thanks to the pneumatic tubes. Um, anywhere you'd process a lot of paper, pneumatic tubes are good. So what you see on top here is a, almost 136,000 messages a day by, by Sears Roebuck in Chicago. Um, on the bottom you see something about the mechanical messenger is um, everywhere or something at hand. And finally, when I did the research for this at the New York Public Library about lamps and pneumatic tubes, I had to write little things. I brought them up to the, ca the counter and they sent them off in pneumatic tubes. So I'm here to tell you it really is a series of tubes. Thank you. I feel like half the mystery of the, the movie Brazil is now gone. <laughs> um, our next speaker is going to talk about not paper in the cloud, but our data in the cloud and our servers in the cloud and how to measure their use more efficiently. A bit more practical of an Ignite talk this time. Please welcome up Hattrick Media's Niall Kennedy. All right, I'm here to talk about measuring cloud efficiency. We've all heard about the cloud, and it's great things, and it's going to do everything for us. But don't worry, we'll send you the bill later. The meter just keeps on running, and every 30 days, something shows up in your email box, and you start to learn what's coming up next. Well, we can actually look at the electrical grid for parallels. We now have things like kilowatt or smart meters we can plug in at home and understand our energy usage. How are we making sense of all of our appliances in the home, and how can we change those appliances for better use? If you rewind back to 1943, Thomas Watson was very famous for saying there will be a market for five computers. He was right for about 10 years. The big change came in 53 when they started leasing computers to organizations, and now for $15,000 a month, you too could have scientific calculations. Well, today, just last week, actually, Rick Rashida, Microsoft said that 20% of the world's servers are within four or five companies. These are the new cloud computing services. You too can join in this server revolution and take your place in the data center. This is really interesting. This is from IBM. This is the Blue Gene computer uh, down at Los Alamos. IBM is repurposing Blue Gene for cloud computing. They call it Project Kitty Hawk. So if you're doing nuclear uh, explosion calculations today, you might be running Ruby in the future. We think about clouds as a utility. We just plug in. We have computing horsepower. We have storage. We can do everything that we want. But in reality, we're actually plugging in appliances. We have a specific purpose. We want to have a blog. We want to have video codecs transcoded. It's not a limitless resource. We're abstracted from the problem much the same way as we're abstracted from the energy problem. Those towers, those smokestacks keep on billowing out uh, energy and new resources, but really it does come from somewhere. This is what the uh, cloud stack looks like. The bottom half is provided by the vendor, Google App Engine, uh, Windows Azure. The top is all by coders. This is all the optimization that you can do to make sure that your code is going to be as efficient as possible. And why? Because every piece of that code carries a marginal cost. You pay 15 cents for the CPU, you pay another dime for the RAM, and you're paying for every single bit that you're storing on the hard drive. So as you make improvements to your code, you're saving money in the near term and over the long term. We have some swappable layers. You've probably heard of S3. Maso and Nirvonics are two competitors. If we look at static caching, we can look at how we want to change our serving of files, swap out layers on the fly just by using a simple CNAME uh, abstraction. 
We can also reduce waste. How do we build into some of our cloud layers things like PNG Crush and JPEG Tran to take the same resources but without the metadata and without the other things that we put for desktop publishing, put it out to the web and save off 10%. The example being Twitter's logo is currently wasting uh, space because they don't run it through PNG Crush. I use Google App Engine. Google App Engine has a lot of meters. They actually get down to the inserts versus updates versus deletes that you run on their database and charge you differently for every single one of those calls. But if you run efficient code, you're actually saving money. You learn how your VM thinks, your virtual machine, and you learn to change your code for that virtual machine. Um, it really, really helps, and I have learned a lot as a programmer just coding on Google App Engine uh, and thinking what would Guido do and changing my code accordingly. Uh, this is what App Engine looks like. That should say Python 2.5.2. These are the base libraries that are already built in. These are free. These are already loaded inside of memory. You, if you take advantage of these base libraries instead of rolling your own code, uh, you have a big, a big benefit. Now, I often hear, well, computers are cheap, servers are cheap, people are expensive. What we're really talking about is training your people for this new world, training them for a cloud computing world, a world of, of limited resources, and using that more efficiently. My analogy here is looking at something like Energy Star that we use to rate appliances. In the future, what if we had an Energy Star rating for web apps? What if our web apps, such as WordPress and Drupal, had a total cost of ownership, a total CPU usage, and a total RAM, and we decided between one platform and the other based on that? Another idea that I had, in the future we'll roll back the meter on our cloud usage. We might run AdSense or AdCenter on our sites and roll back that Azure or that Google App Engine instance. We still haven't seen that. We're starting to get smart meters in the electrical world. This is from Tendril, it's a Colorado company. It tells you that you left the lights on past 11 p.m. or you could have a better refrigerator. We have nothing like that in the cloud world. Google.org announced their support for smart meters, but Google App Engine doesn't have it yet. So we start to think about clouds and our programming in the clouds like tuning a car. Uh, Obama liked to say that if you just inflated your tires a little bit more, you get better gas mileage. There are many different examples of how you might inflate your tires or change your code just a little bit to eke out earnings in the future. Thank you. Uh, my blog is nilekennedy.com, and that's my email address if you want to get in touch. Thank you, Niall. And now we are going to go decidedly towards low-tech craft uh, with our own gorilla knitter, Rose White. Please welcome up Rose. Hi, so I was born a geek, but at some point I learned how to knit. And um, what I've noticed over the years uh, since I learned how to knit is that not everybody takes my word for how awesome knitting is. And in fact, they sometimes make the um, assumption that knitting is a low-tech activity. Um, but uh, when uh, uh, the, the first thing that I can start to, to tell you, though, is that knitting can be graffiti. Um, this is, these are some examples um, the, on the right there that knitting is in Stockholm. Uh, on the left, of course, that's at the entrance to Manhattan. And then the middle there, that's um, gloves in, uh, in Seattle on a statue of Lenin. Uh, gorilla knitting uh, uh, has been, I apologize, has been uh, going on since about 2005 uh, when uh, people who had already been doing uh, some graffiti knitting uh, started to publicize what they were doing. There are a lot of preconceptions about knitting um, which have involved grandmothers uh, and yoga. Um, those preconceptions have been changing. Um, here at a convention that is so much about open source, what I need to make sure that you know is that knitting was originally proprietary and that it was reverse engineered. Uh, that was something that happened in the Renaissance, and that was something that made knitting shift from being a luxury uh, that was reserved for nobility to something that anybody could do. Um, so something that was done in guilds by people who were highly paid to something that uh, people could do in their homes. Um, all of you are wearing something that's knitted, um, probably if you're wearing underwear. Um, but uh, that was a shift that happened over the last couple of centuries with the Industrial Revolution when dangerous new technology like knitting frames came in. Uh, that is a picture from the uh, textile brain art uh, gallery that is online. Uh, and I encourage you all to have a look at it. Um, Luddites were not worried about 
the frames themselves. They were worried about too rapid progress. And that's a, a refrain that I think that we've heard a lot over the last few decades and we hear even today. Um, at the end of the 19th century, um, the shift was to um, women uh, doing very intricate needlework, um, which they were doing because they were surplus labor. They weren't working at home. And that surplus labor made them sort of elite workers um, who were doing private labor. Um, this is the new example of elite skilled labor, which is no longer lace doilies, but you know zombies and um, octopi and Burning Man art. Um, the piece on the left is a piece from Burning Man a year or two ago that unravels in the wind um, and was a collaborative project where people sent in um, knitted pieces and it dissolved over the week. Um, that's a huge uh, knitted American flag that was made with those cranes on the site of the uh, Mass Museum of uh, Modern Art. Um, and Kat Matza does a lot of um, incredibly subversive work around consumerism. Um, these pieces are um, from a coral project and the, the work that's being done um, there um, illustrates mathematical principles, but then it also um, duplicates um, when, when the knitting is done, it um, exemplifies coral. Um, these pieces use um, the Mobius strip in the middle, of course, is a Mobius strip, but then the DNA and the shellfish, the starfish work on the left um, are illustrating scientists, uh, science um, images. Um, there's sort of explanations about why knitting's become more popular in the last few years. Um, some of those seem gratuitous, like, oh, it's been post 9-11. Uh, um, but really, we just like to make things. And I think many people here understand that sense. Um, we don't have to make things. That um, bear on the left is made of lead. Um, even so, even though it looks like it's a cuddly teddy bear, um, it would poison you if you cuddled it. Um, so you probably don't want to do that. Um, those are amiguri, uh, amigurumi um, little octopi, and then that um, knitted jacket on the right um, is just a gorgeous object. Um, coding for amusement is really the same as knitting for amusement. Um, and women are typically taught to knit Men are more typically familiar with computers, but tools are neutral and anybody could use them. And if we give everybody access to both sets of tools, then anyone can use them. And so everybody here I encourage to learn how to knit, just as I encourage everybody to learn how to play with an API. So um, here are some ways for you to learn how to knit. Um, you could look for knitting classes where you live. And if you buy some yarn, you could look for me at the conference. And I'm sure we'll see some of her creations around the conference throughout the week. And if you want to learn more crafts, we have the Maker Shed open the next three days with a lot of instruction. Now we're going to have a very brief Arduino interlude by Tom Igo. Thanks. I'm here to hack the format because I'm only going to do a minute and a half on this. Uh, so my talk is basically on uh, what have you been up to with the Arduino guys. Um, mostly arguing. We do a lot of that in our, in our business. Um, but uh, basically, we've got a few new things coming up, and, and I told Bray that I wanted to talk about it. So uh, here I am to do just that. Um, this is the Arduino Dieci Mila. Some of you may have seen or some of you may have used. In fact, how many of you have used an Arduino in the house? Anybody? All right, a few people. Good. So the question often comes up, what are you guys up to? Because we tend to move a little bit slow, um, as indeed sometimes do slides. But... Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, these are the, the five team members that I work with, and you know the joke often goes, what happens when you take two Americans, two Italians, and a Spaniard and put them uh, in a bar together? Well, the answer is they come up with Arduino. Um, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but nonetheless, uh, we've been working away. This is uh, the second time we ever met, which was last year, uh, and we sat down and we said, okay, let's really come up with something interesting and new to do with the platform, because most of what we've been doing with this open source microcontroller platform, Arduino, there it is again, is we've been doing incremental changes. You know, we've added a few things here and there. Uh, we've made it a little bit easier to use. We've made it a little bit uh, more memory, things like that. But, you know, it still needs some improvements. We know that it needs more work. And there have been some great hacks from the community. We really love to see some of the variations on it. Um, 
But at some point, we need to add our own. Now, here are some things that are wrong with it. There's not enough pins that people complain about. There's not enough memory. Um, there's not enough serial ports because it's only got you know 13 uh, digital ins and six analog ins and uh, one serial port. So it's, it's limited. So this is our new product that's coming out this week. It's the Mega. It's got a lot more pins. It's got a lot more serial ports. It's got a lot more memory. Uh, specifically, you're going to find out if you can count faster than this slide goes down. Um, the answer is that it's got uh, 16 analog ins. It's got uh, 13 PWMs. It's got 54 uh, digital ins. It's got four hardware serial ports, which I've been loving because I do a whole lot of different serial stuff. Um, it's got a lot more memory, too. It's running an Atmega 1280. It's got uh, 128K memory. And um, it should be available sometime within the next week. Uh, if you're interested and you want to get one right away, don't bother looking for it on the site tonight because the Italians are asleep and they actually make it. Um, that's the whole story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And I don't recall if he mentioned it, but that's open source hardware, which means if you need a business plan, if you need something to do in your spare time, you could go also make your own Arduino Mega and try and uh, make some money that way. Our next speaker has, he created a project that went around the globe, added a lot of content to the net in a very geo-friendly fashion, and he's here to talk about exactly how he created that. Please welcome up Tariq Carolla. Thanks. So my name's Tariq, and uh, I have a company called Uncommon Projects with my business partner, Josh, in New York. And uh, we try to do sort of R&D for hire projects, and we did this special bike project. It was a little bit of a, um, a dream come true. And uh, we got this like dream call that was like, can you make 20 Flickr uploading, geotagging, solar-powered bikes in two months? And so um, you know, we're like, yeah, absolutely. And we're getting paid for this? That's awesome. So it was a really fun research project. Um, we got to think about different platforms and um, hardware and software, server side and uh, client side, how users would interact with the bikes to take a photo or not take a photo, ambiently take a photo, how we'd power these things for weeks at a time, um, and what the user experience would be like online, how to uh, theft protect them and weather protect them. Um, 20 bikes, 11 cities, five continents and a whole lot of photos. In fact, I think there were something like 60,000 photos or something like that. You can search for the Y bike tag on Flickr and see some of them. Um, each bike has a, an accelerometer on it and it takes a photo when the bike is moving. It doesn't if it's not. And sometimes when the bikes are moved indoors, you get some really interesting sort of abstract ephemeral pieces, a sort of sense feel piece about what a space might be like. And I was looking at this photo stream for this bike and I was really reminded of um, the work of a photographer named Lee Friedlander who did a series of photos called At Work in the 80s and 90s in New York. And he was kind of exploring what it's like to work in cubicle land in corporate America with dropped ceilings and fluorescent lights and cubicles. And I was thinking, is this bike referencing Lee Friedlander? Does this bike, is this bike trying to say something? Is it trying to say that I'm more than a vehicle, I'm a, I'm a mode of expression, and I'm a photographer too. Um, so, you know, I went to the photo stream. What other photos were out there? What were the bikes doing? And, you know, what photos were they taking? And what photographers were they channeling? Um, so, you know, uh, Cartier Brissant, famous. J Jacob Rees uh, sort of documented these really horrible working conditions of poor New Yorkers in New York. And here we see an overworked day laborer at Flickr who's probably been scribbling on a whiteboard far too long and just collapsed on a couch, you know? And I think that bike is telling us, you know, be careful, people. We have to change this. But, you know, not all the bikes were politically motivated. Some of them were more artistically or, um, you know, aesthetically motivated. I think uh, Lomakev's bike here is just dealing with issues, with dealing with issues of the body or, uh, you know, issues of repetition and uh, creepy children. Uh, not, every, not every bike is, is a Diane Arbus, though, you know? I mean, they're bikes, they're not people. But some of these photos are pretty darn good, you know? And, uh, and what are these bikes trying to tell us? I, you know, I think this bike is trying to say, hey, folks, you're going there, and I'm not, because I'm a bicycle. 
And so that, that kind of sucks for you. Um, Cartier-Bresson had this theory of the decisive moment. This, uh, the, the, the thing that distinguished photography from painting was the artist's ability to capture a fraction of a second intuitively and, and show us something beautiful about the way that we live or um, about the world that, that we live in. And um, I think that some of these bikes are getting at those decisive moments that Brisson was on to. Um, Gursky, Andreas Gursky does these great elaborate pieces that show us sort of the, uh, the, the products, the, the overwhelming repetitive products that we create. And I think Chirico's bike is saying, hey, I could be Gursky too, you know? But, you know, I could be wrong. <laughs> a million monkeys with a million typewriters with a million years could create Shakespeare. And, you know, we may just be looking at, at luck, right? But I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming here, folks. Coincidence? I think not. You know, I think there's something else going on here. I think these bikes are trying to tell us something. I think they're trying to say we're bikes and we're photographers too. Uh, you know, I don't think we're talking about monkeys with a typewriter here. I think we're talking about ghosts in the machine. And uh, machines have feelings too. And you people need to liberate your bicycles because there's an inner photographer there. Anyway, uh, I think that's all for today. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I'll, I'll have uh, one of the bikes for show on Wednesday. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tariq. If you are interested in the tech behind that bike, how they kept it going for two weeks without charge, he'll be deconstructing it Wednesday night at the Arts Fest. And we have two more talks left, one on evil and one on living dangerously. Brad's going to talk about evil. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about cloud computing from a different standpoint. And, and in cloud computing, I mean cloud applications, where you keep your data and so on out in the web. I'm from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We do free speech and privacy. And so this has become of interest to me as science changing. So what is cloud computing? Well, basically, you have users <laughs> who are connected to a network to servers which sit in the cloud. And those servers provide data back to the user, but the data stays on the server, and that's one of the most important things about it. So uh, we've actually had a pendulum. We started with time sharing. Um, we actually moved to personal computers, which people loved because no one could tell them no about what you did in your own personal computer. Now we're going back to time sharing. Cloud applications are a form of time sharing where the application sits out there. Now. Uh, the problem is this takes the data out of your hands. And the Supreme Court has unfortunately ruled that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy when the data is in the hands of third parties. Now, if we move all of our data out of our homes and into the cloud, what we're really doing is quite surprising. Um, it ends up that we're erasing the Fourth Amendment, a line from the Bill of Rights. And that's pretty dramatic. Your data is not protected by the Fourth Amendment out there in the cloud. We have to think about what we're doing if we're going to do it and make sure that it's worth it if we're really going to do something this dramatic. Because things have been changing. A lot of applications have really changed the dynamic. Facebook changed signing up to a, for a new website to what they call installing an application. You give all your data to a new third company by checking a single box. In the old days, if you signed up to a new website, there were, you, they couldn't ask you for 100 things or you simply wouldn't have signed up in the first place. Now, that means we're changing the balance of how things work. No one's going to have you know, everyone in masks or everyone naked. What we have is a balance between privacy and convenience, and we're not thinking about how we're changing that balance. And it's just important that we sit down and look at this, because no one cares about their privacy until after it's invaded. I call this the fundamental theorem of privacy. But privacy actually matters. People don't understand that if you give a big sea of data and you let someone go look at it with something in mind, they'll find it even if it's not there. And people do not understand that scientists are trained not to do that. Why is this a problem? Well, ease of use can actually end up being a bug. Because if you make something easy to do, it's going to be done more often. I think that's a bit tautological. So what you make easy to do and do with one click, you make it easy to ask for it. Why won't you do it? It's just one click. Easy to do is also easy to demand. Because now you can say, look, 
we're not going to let you on our cool website unless you give us everything. And wh what's your problem? It is just one click. Why are you so bothered by this? Look at the mag stripe on your driver's license. Makes it really easy to get all the data off the driver's license. Does anyone think it enhances their privacy? So a lot of people say, let's solve this with user choice. You know, the users can choose. How many of you read all those contracts that say, I agree that you've clicked on? Yeah, n none of you do. I know this. There's no negotiation in those contracts. Real negotiation takes place when you have two parties with power, and they can actually debate things. So in the past, we used to get off OK, because they let the tinfoil hat people have their way. If you complain, they fix things for you. But we're moving towards a future where if you want to be the tinfoil hat, if you want to say this is privacy invading, they're just going to say you can't play. The other thing that cloud computing actually does, which is a little bit strange, is it can actually inhibit user power. People do it because it scales well, but I cannot make Facebook faster by buying a faster computer. Uh, so I think we're also worrying about a, if you want to move from one cloud application to another, you have this data portability. The problem is the data exported is data lost. Uh, we have learned time and time again, data that's given out to people, even for one purpose, always gets repurposed for something else. You cannot get it after the horse has left the bag, the genie has gone. All right. So we have to make sure that we don't install a switch in the government that lets them switch it from police state, from free state to police state. The reason is we're building all the infrastructure to do this, but we're just hoping that nobody will abuse it. But we're giving them this switch. The old way of taking over having a police state was to put tanks in the street. All right? I think we should demand those tanks. There needs to be a barrier. that You cannot just have a switch, a change in policy to make this happen. You want it to be so that something physical has to happen before rights are taken away. Let's look at some nightmares. All the technologies we build here, maybe we trust our society here not to abuse them. But those technologies get exported to Saudi Arabia, to China, to the China of the future, and to our future governments who we may not trust anymore. We also have to worry about the threat of time-traveling robots from the future. Now, by which I don't mean the governor of California, but what I mean is AI software in the future that's much better than today's AI software and can look back in the past and analyze the data of the past. Great face recognition from 2030 will know where you were today. Imagine that Falun Gong had been on Facebook when they organized, and then the Chinese government had said, hey, let's round up everyone in Falun Gong. It would have been really easy for them to do that. So this is going to happen in the future. There's going to be a nightmare like this. Some group will be on Facebook and be rounded up in some oppressive country. I want to give my last 15 seconds to do an ad for my other eTech talk, which will be on Thursday at 11.15, where in a much, or 11.55, in a much happier way, I'm going to tell you how robot cars can solve all of Tim's problems, all our energy, and get rid of the leading cause of death for young people. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Brad. And now our final talk. Please welcome Bill Gostell. Hello, everybody. My name is Bill Gerstel. Uh, I'm a contributing editor at Make Magazine. I'm also one of the producers and on-air talents on Make, uh, Make Television. My talk today is called The Art of Living Dangerously. It's something I've been studying for all oh, the last couple of years. I find it a very, very interesting topic and one that's filled with a lot of potential to make your life better. I want to start out with some pictures. This is a picture of young Thomas Edison. He got a job early in life on a train going from Grand, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan to Detroit, and he sold papers on the train. He also built a laboratory in the baggage car. He did a lot of experiments there. He blew up the baggage car, but he went on to do some wonderful things. This is uh, Packard, of Hewlett Packard. As a boy, he went into the World Book Encyclopedia, figured out how to make his own dynamite, and he had a great time. as a very young fellow blowing up stuff in the farm out in somewhere in California. This guy, is B.F. Skinner, perhaps the world's greatest behavioral psychologist. I love this picture of him. Look at that forehead. What a smart guy. He built a really kick-ass cannon, and he was like the, the, uh, oh, the envy of all his friends because he was so clever with it. This is Francis Crick, the uh, co-discoverer of the DNA molecule. As a boy, he got in a lot of trouble with his parents because he used to love to put chemicals in glass bottles and blow them up electrically. Well, it didn't always work out so well, but he came to some compromise with his parents and they allowed him to do it. This is Boris Yeltsin. Look, what he's, look at the finger on his left hand. That's a trick question. He has no thumb on his left hand because he blew it up as a child playing with uh, dynamite. Actually, it's a hand grenade left over from World War II. 
but he went on to do great and wonderful things. This is Gordon Moore, he of uh, Moore's Law, founded Intel. When he was 11 years old, he put four sticks of dynamite together and made this resounding boom that echoed over the California wilderness at the time. Now there's some things that I want to, a point I want to make about this. All these guys started out early experimenting with the art of living dangerously. Now don't be like Yeltsin, it's not necessarily a good thing to blow off limbs, I'm not advocating that. But the point is, it's good to start early learning the art of living dangerously. Now, but you don't have to start early. If it's, it's not too late for you. Now, is living dangerously a good thing? Is it a bad thing or is it in between? So it depends on how you look at it. I personally think the art of living dangerously is something that everyone needs to learn. And there's some important reasons why you do. Um, you've given a brain. Now, whether God gave you this brain or nature gave you this brain or just evolved, you got a brain for one reason and one reason alone, and that's to handle danger. Your brain is there. If you don't have any danger in your life, you don't need a brain. And I have proof. This is proof. These are called, what the hell are they called? These are called sea squirts. They're a little animal that lives in the ocean. They live in colonies. As adults, they're filter feeders. They sit there anchored to rocks and boats. Uh, hulls. And all they do is filter phytoplankton that comes by. But as juveniles, they look like this. They're mobile. That big white thing is their brain. They have a big brain. They use that brain for one thing, to avoid being eaten. They need that brain to avoid being eaten. But they have a two-stage life cycle. They metamorphosize. And in their later stage, they become this. Look at this. This is called a tunicate. It's a filter feeler. It sits on a rock. It has no brain. This animal eats its own brain. Why? Because it has no danger. They don't taste good. They have no predators. They don't need a brain anymore. You need danger in order to use your brain. Now, there has been study after study after study that tells you that people who add a certain amount of reasonable risk to their lives have a much better, much fuller, and much more successful life. That's been proven in Germany, that's been proven in Canada, that's been proven in the United States. So it's not too late. It's time to learn the art of living dangerously. Hear me all. You learn the art of living dangerously by doing. You must add a little bit of sensible, rational danger to your life. And I have some suggestions for getting started. Here's one. I call it American Tarzan. Now, okay, what this guy is doing may be a little risky. Okay, that's 500,000 volts, and that's not me. I didn't do it, and I think this is actually a Photoshop picture, but it's, it really is a good idea what you could do. You could act out metaphors, okay? If you want to run with scissors, by God, you run with scissors, and you don't take shit from anyone, but, but go ahead and add some danger to your life, because it's a very important thing to do. But there's other ways, too. You can take social experiments. You can do this, for instance. Now, this is not a very good idea, okay? But... You know, social, social adventuring is one way to add some danger to your life. Not necessarily a very good idea, however. So you need other things. Well, I've been thinking about it, and I got a book for you. This book comes out in June. It's my book called Absinthe and Flamethrowers. It comes out in June, available everywhere. Do me a favor. You don't have to buy it. Just get it at the library. But look it over. Blog about it. Tell your friends about it. Review it on Amazon. Come on, give me a little bit of love on this. I'm not, I'm not here to make a buck. I really believe that living dangerously is something that adds a lot of value, a lot of importance, and a lot of fun to your life. I'm Bill Gerstel. Thank you very much.